Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We ask these things in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, being the church geek that I am, I often sit around and think about the perfect dream church. You probably do this a lot too, right? I sit around and think about the dream church. What would the dream church look like? What would it be like? What would it feel like? What would the experience of a dream church be like? I grew up uh, going to a mega church. A mega church is a church that's defined as a church over 2,000 members. Um, Last I counted, there's about that many folks in our town. And I was attending a church of 2,000 people uh, in membership. And then over the course of my involvement with that church, we grew to the point that we would have our Easter Sunday services at Fiddler's Green so that the entire church could get together. Fiddler's Green, I think, holds 20,000 people or something in the, uh, the auditorium there, not the auditorium, the amphitheater. And uh, so every Sunday morning we would get together, uh, Easter Sunday morning we'd get together at Fiddler's and it would be a fun, huge extravaganza. Um, we, that church hosted all sorts of uh, leading musicians for concerts uh, and it was a fun place to grow up. And so I've got to be honest, part of my dream church has some of those things in it. It has excited people who want to be there. People who show up early and give up their time and talent and energy. It has a coffee shop that everybody lounges at and enjoys some fine drinks. Uh, it's like Lala's at the church. Um, uh, my dream church has a bookstore uh, that has all sorts of great theolo theological writings and church fathers. And then it has a, a little bit of a Christian living section, not much, mostly heavy on lots of doctrine and Bible study books. Um, my dream, my dream church um, has a gymnasium, has a swimming pool, has a workout facility, kind of like the rack attached to the church uh, with no membership dues or fees at all. It's just paid for always, and it's always free, and you go in there and have as much fun as you want. It's used mainly for the youth, because the youth are attracted to the building, because it's just such a magnet for them, having all these fun, amazing things, climbing walls, rappelling from the ceiling, when the parents and the elders aren't near. Um, <laughs> just amazing stuff going on. Uh, spiritually, though, everybody is growing, everybody is learning, everybody loves to read. Augustine, everybody loves to read uh, Athanasius, everybody loves to read the Calvin's Institutes, everyone loves to read Luther, everyone is in deep discussions, Bible studies, where they are working through the latest writings by N.T. Wright. Um, everyone is growing and encouraging one another and challenging one another in their spiritual growth. Uh, our kids' ministry, we have to turn away volunteers from the nursery. There's way too many people that just love to be with little kids with poopy pants. And so we have to regularly say, so sorry, there's no more room for you to volunteer here. Have you thought about middle school? And they say, yes, I have, and I love those people. And they come in droves to work with the middle schoolers. In fact, the, the volunteer to student ratio is one on one, where every single kid has an adult volunteer that loves them, cares about them, remembers them, remembers their, their birthdays, sends them cards of encouragement, gives them money. Uh, it's an amazing church. It's my dream church. It's my dream church uh, has a men's group that loves to go out and shoot guns and kill things, not you know animals. And then we come back and we grill them and barbecue them and eat them regularly while going ar a lot, <laughs> or whatever it is we men do. Uh, my dream church doesn't keep me away from Broncos games when they're at 11 o'clock. My dream church has given me tickets that uh, I get to use for all Broncos home and away games. My dream church. It's really kind of obnoxious to hear about a dream church, especially from a pastor, isn't it? I thought it'd be uh, 
tit for tat thing. You can hear about a dream pastor from a church's point of view. <laughs> Let's look at what it takes to be a perfect pastor. He pleases everyone. Preaches exactly 20 minutes, maybe 15 for some of you, and follows it with an invitation in which everyone is convicted but no one is offended. Works from 7 a.m. to midnight in every aspect of work, from counseling to janitorial work. 27 years old with 30 years of experience. <laughs> He's tall and short, thin and heavy set, handsome but not overpowering. One blue eye, one brown eye. <laughs> Hair parted in the middle and straight on one side and wavy on the other with a balding spot on top revealing his maturity. Has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends all of his time with senior citizens. He smiles constantly with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously at his work. Invests 25 hours a week in sermon preparation, 20 hours in pastoral counseling, 10 hours in meetings, 5 hours in emergencies, 20 hours in visitation and in evangelism, 6 hours in funerals and weddings, 30 hours in prayer, 12 hours in correspondence, and 10 hours in creative thinking. Is always available in his office. He always has time for all the committees and activities of the church. He never misses the meeting of any church organization. Is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. Has perfect kids. His spouse plays the keyboard. Did you notice Marnie's at home sick today? The perfect pastor is always the next town over. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Uh, he is talented, gifted, scholarly, practical, popular, compassionate, understanding, patient, level-headed, dependable, loving, caring, neat, organized, cheerful, and above all, humble. And he knows it. Many, many versions of this uh, are found online. You can find all sorts of things uh, describing the perfect pastor. And uh, we all have dream churches. We have dream pastors. We have dreams about what we want the perfect church <laughs> the perfect pastor, the perfect Sunday experience to look like. Did you know that we just fail miserably all of the time? Mainly because my kids aren't perfect. <laughs> I've almost got all the others. Later this year, my book, Humility and How I Alone Attained It, is coming out. It's got a big picture of me on the front. Um, my somewhat thin, mostly heavy set self <laughs> cover there. We all have these dreams of what we want and think we need. And it's out of our consumerism that most of this comes and is shaped. When I was a child, there was a mall that was near our home. It's called South Glen. And we went to South Glen and we found things we never knew we needed at South Glen. It was amazing because I loved going there, especially as, as a middle schooler, because mom wasn't there, dad wasn't there. We were set free on Southland Mall. And Southland had an Orange Julius, which was amazing. We would bug mother for money, and she'd feel guilty if she'd drop us off at Southland, and we'd have money for Taco Bell and Orange Julius. We'd walk around and... We would go to the arcade because we had no video game systems at home. We had to feed these things 25 cents a pop to die in a minute. <laughs> right next to the arcade, it must have been some kind of marketing genius came up with this, was a toy store called Roy's Toys. Right next to the arcade. It was like they knew where the children would be in the mall. And we would go to Roy's and we would walk up and down. And by the way, this is before Amazon was a thing. This is before we had a Walmart where nearby us. Uh, we would walk into Roy's Toys, and we would find these amazing toys that none of us knew existed. But when you saw it, you wanted it. You needed it. You had to have it. And that's how materialism and consumerism works. You and I have been hardwired. We don't even understand how much of us has been shaped by consumerism. In fact, for instance, how about we all do a challenge this next week where none of us buy anything? 
Well, I gotta do grocery shopping. Just fast. You won't die. Jesus went 40 days. No. What if we, well, I gotta get gas for my car. I gotta get to and from work. You can walk. You got shoes, probably. Well, it's really far. Tough darts. I mean, good luck with that. You made the choice to live far from the place you were. I mean, you could have thought that through before the preacher said, don't buy anything. Why do you live where you want to live? Because I want to live there. Well, maybe it's not practical that you live where you want to live. You need to rethink some of your priorities. We are shaped so much by what we want and what we desire and our consumerism and our materialism. And by the way, before you feel like, man, this guy's just all I love stuff. That guitar, that's a thousand dollar guitar. I tried to buy a cheap guitar, it sounded terrible. It's horrible, those five hundred, six hundred dollar guitars. Piece of junk. This one's borderline. This lens I did you know I want to replace this guitar? with a Martin, because I miss my Martin. I used to have a Martin. I had a $1,000 Martin guitar, and it, it needed to get this one. And uh, I want a Martin that costs $2,500. Well, Steve, that's just stupid. No, it's not. You just don't know. You don't know what that guitar can do. Plus, it's part of my job. Every Sunday morning, I'm playing this stupid thing, and it's irritating when I hit that G string, and it sounds terrible. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> Apparently, you're not very aware. I mean, I'm a materialist. I like things. I want things. It's challenging. I have thought oftentimes because I have this weird minimalist in me sometimes that you might have noticed I wear the same shirt most weeks because I'm a minimalist. I don't like clothes. I mean, I like clothes. I just don't like having lots of them. I don't care. But really expensive guitars? I care. Cars? I don't care so much. I like to drive nicer, sort of nicer cars. I, I, if they turn on, I'm excited. <laughs> gets decent gas, gets me where I'm going. Wow, yay, that's a good car. Goes 5,000 miles an hour. I'm never, that's not practical in my life. But a guitar? Or, I mean, we all have our thing, right? Wives, your husband has his things, right? Men, your wives have her thing. Your wives don't do that. Don't have that. Your wife has her thing. Your, your kids have their things. We all have our thing, our hobby, our interests, what we want more of. And it's regularly shaped by commercials, by magazines, by interacting with others, word of mouth. One of the things that gets shaped in this whole conversation is Christianity. <laughs> One of the things that gets shaped in this whole thing is church. One of the things that gets shaped in this whole thing is our view of God and what he can or can't or what he should or he should not be doing for us or to us. And we often get this idea that the, the Christian life is about our comfort. It's about our comfort at the end of the day, that I would be comforted. Didn't Jesus say that when I go, I will send a comforter to you? He will comfort you. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It's like Linus is blanky. I'll just be comforted by Jesus' comforter all the time. And I go to church, and I look around, and the guy talks for more than 20 minutes, and, and we sing songs that are too high, or I don't like them. They're not my preferred style. Where's the organ, for goodness sakes? Well, there's all sorts of things. And we start to get the idea that maybe I'm not supposed to be comfortable. Well, that can't possibly be right. Because we're good Americans, and we worship comfort. We want to be comfortable Anybody have an uncomfortable Christmas, like on purpose? No. You go outside, turn off the hot water, just for fun. Maybe <laughs> turn off the heat. Did anybody, like, not get any gifts and just explain it as, hey, tough darts, kids, it's supposed to not be comfortable this year. That's an uncomfortable com conversation all of a sudden for you. I mean, we love and we worship and we thrive on comfort. In fact, 
in church world, this creeps in. Instead of having times when visitors stand up and say, state your name, we've gotten away from that because that's too uncomfortable and awkward. And it is. <laughs> I'm an introvert. I know. Right? I don't even like, that's why I slept in last week, because I didn't even want to go to another church, because I'm like, ah, that's a lot of work, and I don't know the people, and then they'll find out I'm a pastor, and then they'll ask me to preach or something stupid. <laughs> or at least pray before the potluck. We want comfort. That's why I didn't go to church last week. I wanted to be comfortable. It creeps into churches. We, we want the kind of worship. We want the kind of preaching. We want the kind of style. We want it to fit us. We want what we want. We want what we like. In many ways, church has caved. In many ways, the church has caved on this. There are churches that at the national denominational level are wrestling with what's sin and is not sin. I mean, is it okay if somebody is a gay or a lesbian? Is it okay if somebody is sexually active outside of marriage? And there's all sorts of things. Those are just the two that come to mind. They're always the below-the-belt issues, it seems. Back in the day when I was a kid, the questions were vastly different that were being wrestled with at the church. And the church is always wrestling with how to be relevant to the culture and faithful to the gospel. But I want to suggest to you that as the church, and as the way I put it, the way I think about it, is the church in America is losing home field advantage. Did you watch any of those wild card games? The Chiefs, I don't think they have home field advantage, those poor folks. Better to have a bad season like the Broncos than be the Chiefs in the playoffs. If you're a Chiefs fan, tough darts. So. You didn't come here to be comfortable, I hope. <laughs> we lose home field advantage in the church. It's becoming more and more difficult. It's becoming harder. It's becoming more countercultural to follow Christ and to follow the historic teachings of the scriptures, the historic teachings of the church. It's becoming more and more difficult. You may, if you follow Jesus, Hear things like you are bigoted, you are hateful, you are backward, you're on the wrong side of history. You may hear things like that. And if you don't hear them in Ray, don't worry, it's coming here. It will be here, it is already here. There are already people who email me when I state just reading the scriptures on issues like homosexuality. There are people who take issue with the scriptures teaching. And I want to make it really clear. That's the scriptures teaching, not my opinion. If it was up to me, I'd probably change it because it's hard. Because it's divisive. Because it can be mean. Or at least taken that way. But we are losing home field advantage. And when Jesus died on the cross, we forget that, don't we? We forget our founder, the guy who kicked it all off, was executed. He was executed by the state. In fact, he had one prayer that went unanswered. He had one prayer that went unanswered. He was in Gethsemane the night before his execution. And he said, Father, if it would be your will, Take this cup from me. And he experienced prayer like most of us experience prayer at that moment. Crickets. Silent. And then an angry mob showed up. <laughs> we forget that. We forget at that very moment when Jesus Christ was most desiring comfort. When his flesh is crying out, I don't think death's a good thing. I think this is going to hurt. I don't think I can go through with this. I'm not interested in blood and sacrifice and torn body. He was denied by God the Father. Now he was smart. He started out this way. If it be your will. Most of us don't even bother with that part. 
Most of us just say, you know what? Well, you know what would be great, God? You know what would really help me out? You know what would make my life better? You know what would make this worth living? You know what I need? And every once in a while, man, we feel convicted. And we start going, well, I mean, if it's cool with you. Jesus started out. Your will be done. And we, for some reason, and I think it's just the Western church, but it's sadly we've exported, exported this around the globe, this comfort gospel, this, that Jesus just wants you to have the American dream and to be happy. And I think as we lose home field advantage, we are going to find that following Jesus is not about our comfort. It is about our faithfulness. And we're going to find, and I think we find this out already, but most of us are in denial on this piece. The church is a place full of discomfort and awkwardness. But God uses this to challenge us and help us grow. You see, I've grown up in the church. I'm like a fish in water. And I almost feel like I need to take... You know, an extended break from church someday. Maybe when I'm 60 or something. I need to take an extended break from church because I don't know what life is like without church. And I've always been in church. I grew up in church. And part of growing up in church is you become inoculated. You, you become clueless to what church is and what it does and how it functions in your life. But one thing I do know as a kid is that the church was a place that made me feel uncomfortable. The church was a place that was awkward. How do I know that? Because nowhere else in my life did some guy get up and talk to me for 30 minutes and I couldn't even ask a question. I couldn't even, well, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Nowhere else in my life did we sit around and sing songs about God and Jesus as a group next to, you know, those tone-deaf people. You couldn't sing. Nowhere else in my life were we encouraged to get into a small group of people. Well, what if I don't like them? What if they're not fun? What if, what, if, what, if, what if they're different than me? What if they have different... What if they're a Democrat? What if they're Republican? What if they're from Yuma? What if... And we were asked to get into these small groups and be part of something. And the vast majority of people just didn't bother to do it. But those of us who were at least trying to pay, like, pray, play like we were following Jesus would go through the motions, we'd get involved, we'd sit there and we'd be like, yeah, it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, totally like I thought it'd be. After a month or two or after you felt like God spoke to you and said you didn't have to go back anymore, then you quit going. I knew that church was uncomfortable because they always wanted us, they kept bogging us, bothering us to read this thing. A book from the Iron Age, for goodness sake. A book that had all kinds of goofy names. I mean, even the name Javen is in here. You know, it's like, what kind of name is Javen? <laughs> Our funeral guy is so excited for his name. <laughs> He's like, my mom named me after somebody in the Bible. Nobody even, none of the Christians even know my name's in the Bible. <laughs> Like Javen, that's a weird name, man. There's no J's in Hebrew. It's probably Yavan. Don't go tell him I said that. My funeral discount will be gone. It's full of names, full of places, full of weird people, bloodshed, circumcision. What? Why is this in here? You want me to sit down and read this thing every day? All the time? Why? On top of that, then they had the nerve to ask us to reach into our wallet as we pull, you know, put this thing around. It's like, what, what's, why are you asking for our money? You can't make work any other way for you, Pastor Guy? What, what is this about? It was, it was awkward. It was uncomfortable. As a kid, I've always known church to be uncomfortable and awkward. Then we went to Cherry Hills, and it got more comfortable and less awkward, but it was still uncomfortable and awkward, parts of it. And that's just part of God's idea, by the way, God's idea of church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, 
It's his idea. It's his enterprise. His thing. He is in the process of building his church. And Peter picks up this language in his little book. His little letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. He picks up this metaphor. He's got a couple metaphors he's playing with. One is this idea of stones and living stones. And I think he's talking about the temple, the ancient Jerusalem temple. But I also think he's got in mind maybe what Jesus said. I'm building this church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, guys, it's on the screen. If you could get up there for me, that'd be great. It says in verse 24, He himself, look, that's not right. Four, sorry, four. It's like, man, I got that much proper. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That probably needs some unpacking. And one of the things that we can't do in English, but I wish we could, is we don't have a plural you. The closest thing we have is our friends from Texas who say y'all, right? Or in Colorado, you guys. You know, East Coast, they kind of do that too. We've got this plural in Greek. Greek has a plural you. And when we come to passages like this, it's really easy. And by the way, this stems back to our consumerism and our materialism, our individualism. When we come to a passage like this, we read it very individualistically. And you're not supposed to do that. Because all of the yous in here are y'alls in here. This is not you are being built as a temple of God. It's y'all are being built as the temple. Peter is talking about the importance, the primacy, the function of the church in this passage. He reiterates this in verse 9 when he says, but you are a chosen people. Again, we have to read it plural. But y'all are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called y'all out of darkness into his wonderful light. Back to verse 5. Y'all also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood? (laughs) You see, this is... God's idea of the church. This is his dream church. And notice how far off my dream church is from his dream church. His dream church is that we all would be molded and shaped into the spiritual house where we are all functioning as priests. Where we are all offering sacrifices that are holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. What does that mean? It means that you would sacrificially love other people, starting with your family. Remember what Paul the Apostle said to husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Gave himself up for her. Husbands or wives, respect your husbands. It starts in our homes, sacrificially loving one another. It's something that is not to be taken lightly. It is serious. It starts with sacrificially loving our children. And then it moves out of that place. And it moves into the community where we sacrificially love our neighbors, love our employers, love our employees, love our coworkers. Sacrificially. Because some of you have folks who aren't any fun to be around Monday through Friday. That's why it's called sacrifice. 
It also means how we spend our time, our talent, our treasure. Sacrifice. You guys got a huge kudos from the accountant. Attaboy. My girl. Great job, church. You are giving sacrificially. But let me say something. I believe that we have traded in giving sacrificially for giving giving financially sacrificially to giving our time sacrificially because time is now the new currency. Our time is so valuable to us. We would rather pay somebody to do those tasks. We would rather pay some kid, pay someone. We'd rather pay somebody to mind everything and take care of things rather than be asked to give of our precious time. Now, I want to commend you all. We are giving very well. But there are so many other areas. There are so many other things. There is so much that God is asking of us to give. And I'm not just talking about around here. There are so many things in our community, in, 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 our, in Ray and Yuma County, that we can give our time and talent and treasure and if you think I'm just saying this out of my own wanting something from you, give elsewhere. But do it. Give of your time, your talent, your treasure. And do it sacrificially. Then you're acting like a priest. You're bringing to bear on this world God of heaven. You're bringing to bear on this world Christ who died on the cross for us. You're bringing to bear on this world this reality, this truth that's proclaimed in the scriptures. And you are functioning as a priest. As you say these things, as you do these things, as you love these people, as you give to people. Ah, oh, that doesn't sound very comforting. I know. You see, we've traded the gospel of comfort for the gospel of Christ. And when we do that, and by the way, I do it. We all do it. We all trade the gospel of comfort for the gospel of Christ regularly. And when we do, when I do, we should be ashamed. We should desire to do better. Now, oh, well, wait a minute. I read Romans 8. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I, I understand. It's not your eternal salvation at all at stake. It's nothing like that. It's more in the category of well done, good and faithful servant discussion at the end of life. Well done, good and faithful servant. A couple of words in that you pay a really strong attention to the first part. Well done, right? Right? Unless you like raw steak, but uh, I digress. Most of us hear well done, and we're like, yes, I want that. I want God to look me in the eyeball, and I want him to go, man, I'm so glad you're on my team. I want God someday to say, that, that a boy, that a girl, great job, awesome job. We all want God to one day just pat us on the back and go, man, that was fun watching you do that. The other part of that we don't pay much attention to. Well done, good and faithful. Sir, what? What's that? <laughs> Servant? Excuse me? I thought you said you were lucky to have me on the team. Servants don't take that kind of mentality. It's like the pastor who's humble and knows he is, right? A servant does what's asked. A servant does what's expected. A servant does what's demanded. That's what a servant does. And the amazing thing with the gospel is that we have the opportunity, because of God's grace, that we have the opportunity to live our lives in service of the one true God forever after we accept Christ. We get the opportunity. We get the invitation. We are asked 
More than that, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And the Spirit comes into us, and it gives us the empowerment and the excitement and the authority and the ability to follow Christ. To do all He asks. To do all He commands. To do all He expects. So that at the end of our life, we will one day stand before God the Father, and He will say, well done, good and faithful Servant. We have all that available to us. We have just this short life to leverage for all of eternity. You know, there's days that I mope around. Anybody ever mope around? True confessions. Pastors mope around. Because even while they're pastors, they're still people. And there's days I mope around. And there's days that I have this mantra on my lips. And my mantra is, thank God, this is not my own. Thank God I won't always be here. There's days when I mope and I think 10,000 years from now, this day of moping will be long forgotten. 10,000 years from now, these travails, these trials, these situations, these Irritants, these things in my life that are frustrating me will be long gone, forgotten. Thank God this is not my home. I will not always be here. Why can I say that with such confidence? Because I have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. I'm seeking to follow Him. Even on the mopey days, I have breakthroughs that, oh yeah, I'm supposed to follow Him. Even that day. And I have this knowledge, this understanding that this isn't all there is. And I have an opportunity to leverage this short life of mine to pile up just disgustingly exciting, awesome treasures in heaven that can't be taken. They'll never rust. They'll never break. Kids, have you already broken that Christmas gift you got? There are gifts in heaven that will never grow old, will never break. The greatest gift of all is God himself. And we will never grow weary of worshiping him. We will never grow bored with him. We will never, ever get to the point where it's like, gosh, I heard this one. Every day he will blow our mind. Every day his mercy will be new. Every day his grace will just explode upon us. Every day gratitude will well up in our hearts. Every day, 10,000 years from now. And you and I can leverage this life. If we will just be willing to be uncomfortable if we will be willing to be awkward with one another at times. You see, Jesus said something that's very countercultural to us. John chapter 12, verse 22, or 25, excuse me. He said this. If I can find it. I need glasses, my goodness. Those who love their life will lose it while those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. <laughs> See, Jesus had very countercultural ideas. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. You see, what Jesus is saying, what the scriptures tell us is that the Christian life is supposed to be uncomfortable. So embrace it. The Christian life is supposed to be uncomfortable. Embrace it. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Jesus said, do not be surprised if in this world you have troubles of many kinds. Jesus said, a disciple cannot be greater than his master. If the world hated me, it will also hate you. Jesus said these things. And at the end of the day, we all have to ask ourselves, what gospel have we believed? What gospel are we clinging to? Are we clinging to the gospel of comfort, or are we clinging to the gospel of Christ? So 
let me encourage you. Let me exhort you. Let me plead with you. Small groups are awkward. They are uncomfortable. But it's how we grow. I've had people say insanely irritating and insulting things to me in my life (laughs) in the context of small groups. My first small group was called family. (laughs) Get your hand out of that. Stop touching that. You can't watch that. You can't hang out with those people. That's not nice. Say you're sorry. Apologize. You know what? I'm going to disown this small group. These people are insane. I should be able to do what I want to do. And then my second small group, I was in middle school. We had a cool young guy in college. You know, you guys think this is all important and everything, but someday you'll grow up. Oh, shut up. What do you know? She said no. He was kind and tried to it's okay, it's not the end of the world. Oh, what do you know? It's terrible. You're going to make it. I doubt it. <laughs> then I got into high school, and I was the small group leader of a bunch of middle school kids. <laughs> Shut up, you're going to be fine. <laughs> I've got, do you think you got problems? I've got problems. <laughs> then my small group leader, who was a young adult, We'll sit around and say, do you think you got problems? I got problems. <laughs> you see, small groups are meant to be uncomfortable. They're meant to be awkward. They're a place where somebody does this to us. What's wrong with you? What are you thinking? Treating your wife that way. Treating your husband that way. Treating your children that way. What do you think? What are you thinking? It's all about you. You think this is just about you. What are you thinking? That's what a small group does. That's its point. That's its purpose. And the church, I plead with you, I ask you, get involved in small groups. Get involved in community life in this church. Stick around for the potlucks. I might have to sit by somebody I don't like. I might have to eat something I can hardly stand. Tough. It's uncomfortable. Embrace it. (laughs) Jesus said, if you love this life, you'll lose it. But if you let go of your life, if you give up your life, you will, you will have security to eternal life. Man, who thought the potluck had that potential? <laughs> who thought a small group had that potential? But it does. <clears throat> Choose this day whom you will serve. The gospel of comfort. The gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Sorry that I preached long in 20 minutes again. And I don't have one brown eye or one blue eye. I have two blue eyes. Sorry I'm not the perfect pastor. You and I go rounds about that, I know. You hear me pleading, asking you to make me better and stronger and funnier and skinnier and whatever else. You hear me crying out to you, that you would make this place a dream church. You and I go round on these things. And I know that people here pray for me, for my family, for this church. And in their way, they are going rounds with you. I pray as we wrestle with you in prayer, we would also start to wrestle with one another in community. That you would give us the guts to move into each other's lives. To give permission to people to speak into our lives things that need to be said. That we would take seriously that the marriages in this church are important. We need to strengthen and encourage one another as much as we can. That the children in this community, in this church, are important. And we need to love them and care for them as best we can. That the elderly in this church are loved and respected and wise. And we need to hear from them. That those of us in midlife crisis, we need to see our elders 
and our youth. And we need to remember this is not our home. One day we will be with you. And we have an opportunity to leverage this time here. Even in the midst of busyness and family life and trying to earn a living and trying to retire someday, we can leverage it all for you. May we be faithful to the gospel of Christ. And may we shun the gospel of comfort. Now may the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. Because you're going to be uncomfortable. And you're going to need to know he's got it. And you're going to be okay. Amen.